And this Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, I speak Jesus, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And my text is in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 6, and I'm reading. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. And all of the church said, Amen. say it like you mean it. Amen. There you go. To our television audience, we are celebrating here. Obviously, you're past that Resurrection Sunday, but here, the, the Holy Spirit is filled this place as we worship Jesus Christ here on Resurrection Sunday. My subject is Jesus is the King of Kings. The book of Revelations is the apocalyptical book of the New Testament, meaning end times. Apostle John was the writer. He had been banished to Patmos in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Don't you, want you to know Revelation 1 and 2. Says he testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, the Romans persecuted the Christians who acknowledged Jesus Christ as king instead of the Roman Emperor Caesar. You may recall that even the Jews accused Jesus of insurrection to the Roman general, Roman Pontius Pilate, in John 19, verses 14 and 15, which I am reading. And it reads, It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. Well, what did they shout? They shouted, what? Take him away. Take him away. Do what? Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? And what did he say? We have. I said, we have no king. But Caesar, the chief priest, answered. John writes to the seven historical churches in Asia Minor as representatives of the church universal and the church today. Matter of fact, the church throughout all ages. As you know, seven signifies completion in Scripture because God rested on what day? He rested on the seventh day. In my text verses, John bestows grace and peace to the seven churches. I want you to note again, the scriptures say to John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace from you who is, was, is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. God the Father is the one who he speaks to from who, him who is, who was, who is to come, which later Jesus Christ uh, placed that attribution to himself as well. Then you have the seven spirits, better translation, say the, the sevenfold spirit, because these, this was the spirit that spoke to the seven churches. The, as the spirit spoke to the churches. At the conclusion of praises, at the conclusion of commendations and condemnations to each church, each time you would hear these words, such as in Revelation 2 and 7, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
And to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. God is calling for the over 300,000 churches in America to not be self-led, to not be self-driven, to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches because we are in an age that needs to hear what God has to say about this United States of America like never before. Where we can no longer even define what is sinful, no longer define what is right and wrong, where we have lost our moral compass. We need to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. John calls Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the earth, as the faithful witness. The Greek word is martyr, which is our English translation, martyr, which meant that the faithful witness, the martyr, was the one who gave his life for you and me. The faithful witness, faithful even unto death. Is it any wonder he tells us to be faithful unto death? Because he was faithful unto death. As the firstborn from the dead, he was the first to rise from the dead, sinless, with a glorified body, never to die again. Tell your neighbor real fast, there's nobody like Jesus. <laughs> All through the Old Testament, whether Elijah or other prophets raised boys and, and men from the dead, and the, even Jesus himself in the New Testament rising, raising Lazarus from the dead. All of these people died again, but Jesus, the only one that died rose again, never to die again in a glorified body. And that's why we serve. There's nobody, nobody in the billions and billions of people that have lived on this earth, there is nobody like Jesus. Remember, you see, brothers and sisters, on that Matthew 27 passage, it is clear the dead do rise. <laughs> I'm going to encourage somebody here today. <laughs> there is no worse situation than dead. We don't have whole groups of people going to the hospital to pray for the dead. We go to pray for the families, but we don't go to pray for the dead. And once they're clearly dead, I know you love the person, but you can't handle if they get up. I'm just saying, years ago on one of the Easter Sundays, I showed a clip from the old school Twilight Zone where they were having a funeral for a man in there. And the preacher was preaching, and his, his mama was in there, his daddy was in there, his fiance was in there. He sat up, looked at all of them. All of them left the preacher first. <laughs> and the preacher's supposed to believe in the resurrection. But I'm here to tell you that when Jesus is in your life and you close your eyes in death, you can be assured when he comes, the dead do rise to eternal glory and praise to our Father. This Jesus in Colossians 1, 15 through 18, to, you have to know who he is. The scripture said the son is the image, the icon of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. Not the firstborn in creation, the firstborn over all creation, which means he has the supremacy in all creation, not as some uh, teach that Jesus was the first one that God created. No, he's the firstborn over all creation, and the rest of the scripture supports it. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So let me share this quickly with you. The reason you're able to hold it together when life is really together and rough on you when you're going through death and sickness and hurt and pain and finance, the reason you are held together is because Jesus holds you together like he holds the entire universe together. says he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn 
from among the dead so that in everything, and here's that word I told you, he might have the supremacy. Yes. Psalm 89 says these powerful words to us in verses 27 to 29. And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. You see, throughout human history, men and women, have been consumed with a lust for power. And the older I get, the less I understand it, if you really want to know the truth. Because even if you get all this power that you think you want, you can't keep it because you're going to die. Right. But people sometimes are consumed with a lust, not, not, not for stuff. They want to rule and have authority over other people. Sometimes it happens with my security staff. I have to be careful. I learned at the other church. I, I couldn't let everybody be on my security staff because there were some people who just barely, you know, walk into church, weren't bothering nobody. And this security person trying to put them up against the wall. <laughs> and then it hit me. See, here's somebody always did, never could make the police force so now they want to have somebody that they could show some authority over and so I had to learn that y'all got to be here for a while I got to make sure you normal before I can put you on my security force from the Egyptian pharaohs to the Roman Caesars to the kings and dictators and presidents of today the thirst insatiable What many of them don't understand is that power belongs to God. Note what Psalm 62, verse 11 says. Read it out loud. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. When those in power refuse to recognize the source of their power, and rule, they ultimately go down. Ultimately, the king in your life is the one you worship and serve. It could be a, a dollar bill. It could be your family. It could be that man. It could be that child. It can even be you. I'm reminded of a famous king called Nebuchadnezzar in Scripture who had conquered the disobedient Israelites in 586 B.C., had made them slaves in Babylon. God had risen up these evil people to bring down his disobedient people, the Israelites. God had given Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom, but he refused to give God the glory. Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. Every good thing that's in your life has come from God, whether you praise him, whether you honor him, whether you exalt him or not. Even the breath to deny him, you have to get it from God. God warned King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. You better give me the glory. See, if you don't, something's going to happen. You know, I am amazed as I counsel people who end up going through some really bad stuff. I'm amazed at the number of them who tell me these words. Pastor Singleton, I was warned. Brothers and sisters, we got to be careful as we talk about power and our ability to make decisions and to be disobedient to God. Because what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar after he refused to heed the warnings that God had given him? The Bible says his royal authority was taken away. He was driven away from people. He lost his sanity. He ate grass like an ox. 
His body was drenched with dew until hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. He lived like that for seven years. But you know what? We serve a God of the second chance. At the end of the seven years, this once arrogant king, this once prideful king, this king who gave himself the glory, I want you to hear what this king said out of his own mouth in Daniel chapter 4, verse number 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes toward heaven. I, I raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, like you, let me stop right there because we're going to read this together. Some of you have been given a second chance and a third chance. Some of you now have realized bad decisions and mistakes that you have made. Your sanity was restored when you learned to put Jesus first, when you learned to turn to him. And now you can say like Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Give him praise in this house. <laughs> Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Nebuchadnezzar now recognizes him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Unlike other kings who shed blood, Jesus Christ gave his blood. Other kings shed blood to obtain power and authority over people, but our God gave his life as a ransom for many. The most powerful human being ever walked the earth humbled himself and became subject to death, even the death of the cross. I want you to know Revelation 1, 5 again. The sea clause says to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Love is always proven by how much a person is willing to sacrifice for the object loved. There's some of you. I know how much you love your family because of how you sacrifice. For your family. I don't care if it's in a nuclear family, a blended family, a, a, a single parent home, many times headed by women. And let me tell you something else. We have men here who did not make it with their wives and they divorced and there were kids. But some of these brothers here, they take, they don't have to be followed around to pay no child support. They take care of their kids. You see, just because a relationship breaks up, doesn't leave a person of that responsibility. And I hear men at this church going, that's still my son, that's still my daughter, and they take care of them. Hear me, young women, especially those you, there's nothing wrong with getting married. I've been married 44 years. We got a huge, uh, over 70 people in a marriage retreat coming up in, in two weeks. I like to think I was relatively stingy. I'm tough with a dollar. I manage money well. But I always noticed something about Sister Singleton from the time we were dating. I was so generous with her. I gave her the best I had. 
a person who won't sacrifice for you, a person who won't do their best for you, they don't love you. Love is based on sacrifice. Jesus sacrificially gave himself. I noticed I became a man as my kids were young and, and struggling on a job. And how many of you know to, to work and, and paycheck to paycheck you live broke all the time. And by the time I pay my, my mortgage, by the time I, I pay utilities, by the time I put some shoes on my kids' feet and some food on that table, I didn't even have enough money to go buy me a shirt, to go buy me a tie. But that's the price for giving to people that you love. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, his crucifixion proved the love of God. His resurrection proved the power of God. Note what John says in John 10, 17, and 18. John writes these words. The reason my father loves me is I lay down my life only to do what? Take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one took his life. So I, uh, I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. You see, death is for sinners. Wages of sin is death. But because Jesus Christ had no sin, no grave could hold him down. Even when Satan would come to accuse the Father, he could never say nothing about Jesus' resurrection from the dead because he was faultless and sinless. And only people who are faultless and sinless go to heaven. I bet that woke you up. Because every last one of you saying, well, I ain't faultless. I'm not sinless. It ain't about you being faultless. It's not about you being sinless. It's about you casting your sins on the one who was faultless, who is sinless, and God counts you worthy because you follow the sinless one. Yeah. One day, like John, we're going to go up into heaven. Because Jesus said, I'm going to come back for you. He said, and I'm the dead in Christ arise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds and the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Note what is said in Revelation 4, 1 to 2. 1 and 2 and 6 to 11. John says, after this I looked. And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Now verse number six. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks, who sits on the throne, who lives forever, the 20 for elders fall down before him, who sits on the throne and worships him, who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Can you imagine, after your life is ended, you are now up in, up in heaven. You have loved God, served God, served your family, served your community. After you have gotten your glorified body, Never to die again. 
never to be hurt again. After, <laughs> after you have received your crown of life, after you've received your crown of righteousness, can you imagine? Now you are in his presence. Everything about the Christian faith was true. To be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. Everything was true. Your sins have been forgiven. You are now looking at what eye hasn't seen. You are now hearing what ear hasn't heard. You are now visualizing with your brain what the mind could not even comprehend and understand. You are in the, the presence of God's holy angels. And they are crying out, holy, holy, holy. You are in a position of where you are viewing the holiness of God, the purity of God, the perfection of God. You are in that place where the Bible says that no man shall see him and live. You are in that place looking at him, seeing him. And now you thought that all along that you were going to be walking around heaven talking about your crown. Check out my crown of life. Check out my crown of righteousness. But in that place of glory with God, in that place of holiness and purity, you still going to look at him who sits on the throne. Declare yourself unworthy and take your crown and throw your crown down and fall on your knees and give him praise and glory and honor. I want to see you stand and throw them crowns down. I want to see those crowns. Throw him down like you're in his presence. Throw him down like he is worthy. Throw him down like you are unworthy and give him the praise, the glory, and the honor. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org.